seeing into the future live. This is Rackspace's continuing coverage of TechCrunch Disrupt 2013. Now here's Robert Scobo. I'm Robert Scobo and we're at TechCrunch Disrupt 2013 meeting all sorts of uh, innovators, people who are building the personal cloud and today we're talking to Cloudant about the future of databases. Why does that matter? Well, you're going to hear right now. So who are you? All right, I'm Mike Miller. I'm one of the founders and chief scientists of Cloudant. And what is, Cl what is Cloudant? Tell me a little bit about yeah, it. Yeah, well, uh, straightforward answer is we're a database as a server, or a d database as a service. Um, but you can really think about what, what we've built is um, like a CDN for your database. Yeah. So uh, we take care of problems of scale and latency by taking your data. I mean, it's kind of a crazy idea. Like back in 2008 when we pitched it to Y Combinator, we're like, all right, we're going to take your database, we're going to put it on the internet, and we're going to put it everywhere, right? And people in the enterprise were like, oh my god, it's a terrible idea, right? But actually we've done that uh, and it solves a lot of new problems. So the idea of like mobile sensors or mobile devices, you know, yeah. um, kind of explosion of internet connected things. I mean really there's this incredible amount of like data connection and consumption. And so um, and actually now we have cloud deployed in 35 data centers globally. And so you're always, you know, we're trying to get you 50 milliseconds away from your data, no matter what device or where you are. So we, we were talking about Apple just announced a new iPhone with a new uh, M7 motion sensor in that thing, right? The yeah. sensor doesn't have to wear, wake up the processor, so it can gather data on us all day long. And what now is it going to do with the, that data when we have a watch or a glass or a Nike is supposed to have some shoes with sensors in it? You know, we're going to have lots of data spraying up. How do you com combine all that in a modern database? You know, why do we need something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so a couple different answers to that question. First, you know, the people that really do the magic with the devices are the developers, right? So every device um, that's been successful creates a community and the tools for developers to really do unimagined, you know, things we have yet to imagine with those devices. Um, and I think a lot of what we're seeing now is that we have multiple devices that know about your data and can do incredibly you know, complex or unique things with them. And what we're doing with Cloud and kind of part of this movement of new databases and new technology is to make it easy for the developers to focus on building that app and not doing things like, you know, do I need to sit down and think about my schema for six months or firewall rules or you know, where are my servers going to be? We just abstract that all away and we're even moving you know, closer to the devices so that you have an SDK on the hardware of your choice. So you can always kind of write your, your data locally and let it synchronize to the nearest of those 35 data centers. So synchronizing or fusing data sources is going to be a big deal, That's right? a really big deal already. Because yeah. my calendar is one stream, my email is another stream, my social network data is another stream, my location, where I'm at, is another stream. Uh, and then my car is going to have data streaming off of it, a self-driving car has something like 700 megabytes per yeah. second of data. That's it's incredible, creating. right? So you, right. you have to make it easy to start. And that's where this, this whole NoSQL movement of like schema optional, yeah. it doesn't mean that we like hate on relational algebras. You can do the same things that you want to do, but you don't have to declare that schema up front. So that's really powerful if you want to like turn on a new stream or co-mingle two streams um, later on that you didn't realize you wanted to do initially. It's that flexibility angle that's really powerful. But at the same time, you've got to be able to handle like incredible amounts of data, um, and it's no longer like coming into just one server in one place globally, right? It's got to be able to handle the fact that it spreads across more than one machine and really across multiple continents in our case. The new rock stars in, in this industry seem to be the machine learning people, the, the people who can look through, you know, or build algorithms that look through all the data and find a new pattern and then report that new pattern to you, you know, like like if I'm wearing a fitness sensor, if it if you if you don't tell me what I'm doing right, yeah. you know, it's useless, right? It's just capturing data that's yeah. not giving me any value. It's not giving me points on my fuel van, right? Yeah. So uh, do you agree with that? How does that fit in? Well, I think you definitely see a lot of success from kind of big data in general, yeah. um, from kind of offline clever algorithms and maybe bring together like disjoint data sets. Like, do you read the article about how Obama got elected in yeah, the, yeah. the tech review? Yeah. It's kind of an audacious idea. Like, just give me a database of every American and buy set top data and like these disparate data sets. And when you join them, you know, every single person, how they're going to vote, and you can optimize across that, right? Um, and so I think that those algorithms and ideas have become very powerful and popular. Uh, so far, they've largely been focused in like the offline, you know, yeah. like, eh, give me a 24 hour or one week turnaround. Like what we realized, that's that's the background that I came from. I, I worked at the Large Hadron Collider building out the computing oh, wow. system there. Um, my co-founders worked together for a long time. 
actually a lot of the Cloud and team, we've been, we've been able to kind of uh, coax them, for those that are listening, out of academics um, and into the company. We realize that there's no reason you can only do that stuff offline. You should be able to do it online. Yeah. Right. So aside from like latency, scale, and sync, and the so Cloud and was built do. at CERN. It, it comes mean, out of CERN. Yeah. Because that's the big, biggest and best sensor in the world, right? It's incredible. That thing. Guess how much data that makes per second. Raw. Raw. Uh, un, 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 I forgot what the number is, but it's in a. Isn't it in the petabyte petabyte range? It's about an exabyte a second. Exabyte. If you second. take the number of channels and the bit depth of the ADCs, it's incredible. So obviously, you've got a it's, you know many tiered architecture of custom hardware and then custom software running in mass parallel to get it down to like a manageable you know ten gigabytes. And you a have to run filters on those streams coming off yeah, of the yeah. sensors, right? So we to find you know throw all this data away. It's sort of the same thing the self-driving car is going to have to do, right? Yep. You're you know that lidar spinning around is grabbing seven hundred megabytes a second. You're not going to throw that over uh, LTE network to nope. uh, Google, right? Yeah. So you're going to have to throw away 99% of that data and figure out what's the 1% that actually matters to stream up to the cloud. Right? No, absolutely. And, and then you're going to combine data sets in the cloud. I mean, that's very much kind of like the waterfall, like tiered architecture that we used in physics. Yeah. We actually, I mean, we had one device. We had 200 plus data centers globally. Right, and uh, we had to use all of those, uh, all of that computing power, just to deal with that real-time filtering yeah. and like processing and trying to decide what you're actually interested in, and feeding that back into the the first-level filters. Yeah. So that's really powerful. And this sounds like a, a real paradigm shift, and every time there's a paradigm shift in databases, yeah. a, a billionaire is born. Right? Oracle. Is, I hope so. You know, Larry Ellison made uh, yeah. a lot of money with the first uh, style of relational database that keeps up our you know, banking systems and stuff like that. Yeah. Then they turn in a, what, uh, uh, client server architecture, which is really a little bit further. And now it's uh, about managing streams and fusing streams and doing machine learning and all sorts of fun stuff that even Mark Zuckerberg didn't have to deal with, right? Because he ran uh, Facebook on MySQL and had to shard it and do a lot yep. of fun, a lot of, a lot of fun work to keep it up and scaled. But this sounds like a whole new thing. It is. So, so you mentioned a couple things. Right? You mentioned like you know the lamp stack, client server in general. Um, and we started this company because we are you know we were dealing with large amounts of data. I mean you know biggest data producer out there um, at the time and probably still today. We realized that that you know we couldn't buy the systems we needed to deal with that. And then at the same time, we saw this you know the explosion of mobile in 2008, 2009. It's like these two things break our, our paradigm, right? Yeah. Like the stack is broken. And if you if you take the trends for you know two year doubling time of data uh, or roughly similar for internet connected devices, you know, like you're wearing right now, yeah. like you can just look at that and run it out for a decade and you're like, there's no way our current model works. Um, and I think that's that's awesome, right? As a, a scientist, you know, an inventor, an entrepreneur, it's like that is opportunity. Um, and I think for all the people here at TechCrunch Disrupt, it means that okay, like brand new problems, brand new opportunities you don't even know about. So it's really like a land yeah. grab. But the cool yeah, thing is, you can't shard a, a, a no, stream no, of data it. coming well, off of Twitter, right? I mean, the system has to auto shard it for you. Like yeah. sharding's not a dirty word. It's only dirty if you have to do it yourself. Like, right. You shouldn't have to think about A's through M's over here. And for and, people who don't know what yeah. databases, tell me what sharding means and how you do it underneath. Yeah, the, sharding is just like imagine that you know you 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 only have so much space in a bookshelf for a phone book, you know, and then you know a phone book's like the equivalent of a computer here. And when you can't fit all the names from A to Z in that single book, then you're like, okay, I'll use two books separate. They don't know about each other. Put the A through M's in the first ones and the N through Z's in the other ones. And that's, you know, that's what people always had to do themselves, is application level sharding. And it sucks because when you have to rebalance it, you've got to shuffle everything around and the entire stack has to be modified at the same time. So like Google did that, uh, they mentioned in their Spanner paper, they did that with their F1 ad network, like their workhorse you know, uh, revenue stream. It took them over two years last time they did it. Yeah. It's like, you know, with like the best minds, you know, National Academy of Science. And books. you guys are a worldwide company, you have data centers all over the world. Yeah. Cause, so now you have to not just shard it on your San Francisco data center, yeah. you have to make sure that it's sharded the right way on yeah, New like, York If you want to rebalance between Europe and the US, the whole point is like, the system should do that for you. You, you don't yeah. have to worry about it. So, like, when we talk about making it easy for developers, like, don't worry about sharding. Just know that, like, you sign up, we give you a URL, like, you send us JSON over REST, um, and we'll take care of you know going from that first megabyte up to petabytes, and you know rebalance your data so it's always where you need it to be. A, a lot of people who are on Amazon are complaining to me about performance. Are you, 
you guys are in the high performance area because yeah. you're, well, tell me why. What, why the difference in speed? Well, you know, there are a couple things. We, we tend to pick up a lot of users who top out either on a provider like Amazon or with Shard and MySQL or, you know, even something like MongoDB, which will, will hit a limit. We have some really long tail customers like, you know, five of the top 10 sports apps and mobile and things like that. Yeah. You know, Samsung is a, a giant customer that uses us for, you know, sync on the back end. Um, and so there are a couple things. Performance, first of all, sucks if you don't understand the basics of latency. Yeah. Like so, people write write their application code. Um, you got to have that really close to the database. And so, the biggest uh, hindrance to getting people to adopt the cloud is like, okay, you're going to have to bring your servers to us. Like we've taken the other approach. We're just on every single provider. You know, Rackspace. You know, you name it. So when they say, hey, I'm interested, we're like, all right, we're already in that data center. Like, you know, we can get basically like rack level affinity. Yeah. So you keep it close. Yeah, in other words, uh, yeah. you, you know, Rackspace Cloud's run in one corner of the data center and totally. Cloud is in the other Cloud runs on Rackspace, and, bare metal, right? And then so, you're, you're uh, dealing with the fiber network that's inside the data center, totally. so you have very low latency. We take and, care of all the bandwidth, you yeah. know, negotiations. You, you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and the other big thing is in the cloud, if you're running in virtualized hardware, uh, if it's uh, not a stateful application, that's okay. But I mean, we're running, you know, database doing tens of billions of transactions a day globally. So it's like, all right, bare metal matters. Like we know the machines we need. We optimize across, you know, IOPS, cores, RAM, disk, you know, per dollar. Um, yep. And so, so we the world is sh shifting in data centers to SSD as well. Are you yeah, seeing yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. So we have an SSD option. I, mean, um, I, I remember when Rocky and I started, we were sponsored by Seagate and. Uh, they yeah. sold a lot of hard drives. Now they're having to put SSD in the hard drives to cache. Yeah. And even a you lot of that. customers are going straight all SSD. You right? see it, especially in mobile gaming, right? Yeah. Where like you have people that turn on these like unpredictable cycles, you know, that suddenly get really involved in these mass multiplayer games. Um, so if you're tracking that state, that's where getting out of, you know, for a stateful service, getting out of like virtualized cloud hardware, you know, it's, it's come a long way. And maybe the stuff with Linux containers is going to, you know, be a step up performance wise. Um, but bare metal still matters for us. So we, we, we just make sure that we're already where your app is um, and, and for latency and then make sure that our system is fast on the back end. Because you know, REST is not actually slow if done right, necessarily. Right. And, and the biggest thing we learned is like, uh, we built the system so that, kind of throwing away one of the old assumptions that you got to get everything in a single line. So you're going to have one cursor that goes fast and you're going to block until the next thing is done. Yeah. Just make it lock list, throw all your requests at it at once, deal with them as they come back. Something that like JavaScript programmers are really yep. comfortable doing. So yep. it's a total mind shift for the typical enterprise DBA, but for the web developers here who are building you know, the apps that we use every day, it's just second well, nature. And the, the, the corporation, the enterprise, is switching to this new, uh, G calls it the industrial internet, right? If you're at Union Pacific, a railroad company, they're putting sensors in the railway to listen to the cars going overhead so they know when those cars need to be maintained. That's completely different than 10 years ago. And it, totally now different. those sensors are kicking off tons of data just like your CERN sensor was. Yeah. And that data doesn't need to be in the right place at the right time. It just needs to be up and fused, right? So yeah. you can see a pattern. You know, absolutely. So It's a different world. It, it's not, it's not the Oracle world anymore. <laughs> no, no, and, and so one of the questions we get a lot, you know, people I'm going to be on their uh, America's Cup team. Uh, no, I, I Thursday, like to say, so. like, my wife and I just moved here from Seattle to open uh, open uh, Cloud and Office. Actually, opening out a rack space Geekdom with uh, yeah. Bob Hardinsky and, and the Cloud Kick guys. Um, so we're living on a sailboat right now in Sausalito and watching all wow. the racing, which is fun. But yeah, you know, we get this question back to like the old market versus new about like we offer this exclusively as a service, yeah. you know, um, and we're long on that. And we always get the question like, why? You know, people want to install in their data centers. And the way I look at it is, you talk about like the old markets, with a two-year doubling time, right? People just don't get exponential growth. If, if I choose a point in time right now, and I look backwards, like for all of humankind, like that's a certain amount of data. I will create that much in the next two years. I think that's a pretty good proxy for how the market's going to grow. And so, you know, you. One of the distinguishing things we've done, like database as service, like it's really us, Amazon's DynamoDB, and I guess now your object rocket team, right? We're the only people that write the software and run it ourselves. Um, and I think our hedge is that like half of the market, right, shows up in the next two years, and that's what we focus on. Yeah. All the new stuff, and like forget, you know, migrating legacy enterprise apps. Like Ellison can have that, right? We'll take the other half of the market, which shows up in the next two years. That's yeah. you know, some hand waving there, but that's the basic idea, because I think that. It is all, all new what's happening right now. And as you watch the market evolve, it's like very efficient. You know, all 
kinds how of How do you guys, uh, how do you monetize? Uh, how do you charge for this yeah, new two kind ways. of database? Goes? So we've got a multi-tenant service where you can come, like we want to make it easy to start. So multi-tenant, log in or sign up, it's free up to five gigabytes or something. Uh, a huge number of apps can run for free within that. And you can see if your idea has legs, you know, work it out on the weekend. And if you like it, cool, you can launch it. Um, you get kind of a restricted set of data centers on which that data can be synced or you have to do a little more manually. And then if your app takes off, um, our big thing is, you know, we make most of our money by helping companies survive their own success. Yep. So like a mobile game, right? If you launch a, a, a mobile game like Words with Friends was running on us at the end, yep. um, you know, what do you do with that? Like, do you want to build a 24-7 ops team? Yeah. So, you know, they take their money and their problem, push it across the table, and we, we take their data and then push them trust and, and are basically like a critical branch of their ops team. So then we do uh, single tenants. You choose your points of presence globally, and you pay by the server. Yeah. So it's it's an economic model that works for both of us at scale. It's yeah. pretty nice. No, it's awesome. Yeah, you know, outsource outsource all that stuff because that's not part of your core competency. Yeah, if exactly. you're building a fitness app for this new iPhone and the new Nike Fuel Band, what, why do you want to be in a data center yeah. wiring up set servers? You know, that yeah, doesn't totally. make sense. I mean, that, so, that's the number one thing. We want developers to be able to just like grab these services as APIs that are really powerful and do yeah. something you know really transformative and new with it. Very cool. It's a fun market to be in. It is. What, what's the challenge now for you? Just to get known or just to... Um, you know, that's part of it. Things are going really fast right now. I'm yeah. sure if you talk to, to you know, other, other people in the databases service, it, it's, you know, um, Amazon's own words, it's the fastest growing service they ever launched, you know, DynamoDB, and we're yeah. seeing a really similar thing. No, we're yeah. seeing the same thing with our object rocket we, launch. We can't yeah, we build, can't keep up. We can't keep up because uh, there's so much demand for high-speed database, uh, you know, systems, yeah. and uh, everybody who has a, a point of view there is going to be doing well in the next 18 months. I yeah. Think. So, so that's a big challenge. That just just scale. I mean, as a company, in, in the last year and a half, you scale from like seven people to maybe almost 80 now. Um, you know, we're growing very rapidly the customer base, and and we found a really nice revenue model. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty confident. If we did the calculation of dollars per venture in. Yeah. We're in really good shape on that one. Um, but product-wise, also just making sure that we we're listening to customers and users and understanding like what's most important. And this is like, you know, enhanced geospatial like targeting. You know, like micro targeting kind of. Well, like, I'm let's, here. I'm going that way. What am I going to hit as I go that way? Let's like, talk about that because that, that's not traditional database stuff, right? But it's it's what you need now. It's yeah. it's exactly what you need. Uh, developers are. Um, are going to soon be able to, to know where you are and where you're looking with this device, at least. Yeah. With a watch, it's a little bit harder, but the watch is sort of out in front of yeah. you, right? So if you're holding it like this, you can sort of uh, use uh, the new uh, eye beacon technology to know it's in front of you, right? Yeah. Um, how, how are developers going to have to change their approach to things to do things like, hey, show me all the beer, all the uh, liquor stores ahead yeah. of me? Well, I mean, our take, our, our take is pretty simple, right? You Developers shouldn't have to worry about that. It should just be an API that shows up for them to use. And so, like, here, here's a contrast point to Amazon. Amazon's got all these different little building blocks, and you're responsible for schlepping your data between them, all different billing models and different APIs. You know, we've just said, hey, we'll call it a database because it's the thing that, that handles the data for your app. But really, it's, it's not for, like, business ledgers and, like, static stuff. It's, yep. you know... It's, it stores your JSON, it allows you to merge things, you can do MapReduce, you can do your machine learning in it, you can do your you know, Lucene indexes and, and search, and now geospatial is kind of the next big one. Yep. And beyond that, I don't know, you know, a lot of people ask for graph you know, algorithms and things like that. That should just all be in there in the API. And so you know, we use the CouchDB API for data transport, so it you know, can talk to your, your phone or your browser or whatever. But in the back end, we're, we're just rolling in all these different services because we figured out the auto sharding and the data sync part are, of it. Are you doing any uh, partnerships with like Factual? Because Factual has this location database of all these points. Yeah. Foursquare used them a little bit. Another company, I think Yelp is using them. And a lot of developers are using other APIs out there that aren't in your own data center, yeah. right? Are you, but are you looking at ways of making those things faster so we can do uh, data fusing faster on the fly and make some of these new you know, use cases happen? We're, we're not doing it yet, but uh, we're definitely thinking about it. So if, if we focus on geospatial, there's there's two big parts of that, right? There's the, the ability to like index and quickly look up things, you know, along like, show me all of these in this arbitrary polygon. So that's like half of the power, but the other half of the power is just having certain data sets that you can, you know, get, get uh, to throw into your app. Yeah. So, you know, you see it at the booths here for like the Esri 
you know, for, for example, which is like, all right, I've selected something. Now would be cool if I had demographic information. And I think that is another big part of it that we're definitely hearing that message from our users, but it's not available yet. But uh, we can talk about product updates. Oh, you got a decade to work, right? <laughs> oh, I hope a lot more than that. Oracle's been around for a while, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Where hey, do we uh, learn more about you guys? Cloudint.com. Cloudint? Yep. C-L-O-U-D-A-N-T. C-L-O-U-D-A-N-T. Very cool. Thank you so much for coming out and talking with me at TechCrunch Disrupt. What you guys are doing is really important to everybody else we're interviewing, uh, building Google Glass or wearable stuff. So thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thanks. And we're going to be uh, back here shortly from uh, TechCrunch Disrupt. We're talking with lots of developers who are building wearable computers here or wearable uh, systems. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of Apple fun this afternoon because Apple's announcing a whole bunch of stuff right now as we speak. So thank you for joining us and uh, we'll be back in uh, probably another half an hour. Seeing into the future live. Rackspace's continuous coverage of TechCrunch Disrupt 2013 will continue in a moment. Fast and reliable streaming with cloud files. Find out more at rackspace.com. Still to come, the winner of the Rackspace Develop It, Wear It, Win It contest. Somebody's taking home $10,000. Find out who 